The man known to history as William King Hale was born on the 24th of December 1874 in Hunt County in Texas in what was then the American West. His mother was Mary Elizabeth Gaines. She died when William was three years old and the details of his father, Peyton Hale, are scanned. Indeed, very little is known about William Hale's family background and early life at all. However, he did have an older sister by the name of Martha, who went by the diminutive name Matty, and who would later marry Walter Burkhardt. Her sons through that marriage, Ernest and Byron, also known as Brian, particularly Ernest, would play a prominent role in Hale's later life. Evidently, by the time he was a teenager, Hale was already working as a cowboy in Texas, a profession which, despite the depiction of it as a life of crime and gunslinging in countless Western films, was actually exactly what it was described as, somebody who herded cows across the vast plains of the American Midwest. It was also in his youth that he met and then later married Myrtle Fry. Hale grew up in the American West, a time and place which has inspired many stories, but which is often misunderstood used as it was as the backdrop for numerous films and books. The West was not a homogenous entity. There were many different versions of it, and Hale's later life and the events which he has become famous for took place in a specific version of the West. Broadly speaking, the West was the vast part of North America within the continental United States, stretching from the River Mississippi westwards to the Pacific Ocean. This was a vast stretch of territory which was relatively untouched by people of European descent until the early 19th century, but owing to a series of events, most notably the Louisiana Purchase of the Midwest from France by the government of President Thomas Jefferson in 1803 and the US-Mexican War of 1846 to 1848, this huge mass of territory came under the jurisdiction of the United States by the end of the 1840s then successive gold, silver, and oil rushes in places like California, Tombstone, Arizona, Oklahoma, and Texas brought hundreds of thousands of people westwards in the 1850s, 1860s, and 1870s, seeking riches and a better life. As they did, they began to settle towns and villages all over the region. This westward expansion also brought conflict with the Native Americans of the area a process which we will explore in more detail with regard to the Osage Indians presently. The part of the American West which Hale grew up in and lived much of his life in was the more traditional or stereotypical version of the West, generally rural and isolated parts of the countryside where the trappings of modern Western society were only just being introduced in the second half of the 19th century. There were more developed corners of the country in this respect, for instance, towns like San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco out in California, which were part of the frontier in the 1850s and 1860s, had become well-developed urban centers by the 1890s, much like the towns and cities of the East Coast. Here, the kind of lawless and opportunistic activities which would characterize Hale's later life in Oklahoma were simply not possible by the turn of the 20th century. But the more rural and less developed parts of the West, in regions like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, were still semi-lawless and had a limited form of governmental oversight or law and order. It was here that opportunistic and ruthless individuals, like Hale would reveal himself to be in later life, could acquire massive riches through underhand and brutal behavior, often at the expense of the Native Americans, who were so often the victims of westward expansion. This was the backdrop against which Hale's story would play out. While the details of Hale's early life are very scant indeed, we get a much better idea of his life story from around 1900 onwards. This was the period during which he first settled in Oklahoma, one of the last frontiers of the American West, where society and government were still tenuous enough that the region would not be granted statehood status until 1907, making it the 46th state in the Union. As one modern account of Hale's arrival into Oklahoma put it, he seemed to have come out of nowhere, as an individual with a past that no one knew anything about, and arriving with little more than the clothes he was wearing and a copy of the Bible, the latter being an ironic possession given his subsequent behavior in Oklahoma over the next 30 years. Although still a young man when he arrived in the region, Hale had many of the personal characteristics 
which would identify him throughout his life. Black hair, an owlish face, and a large pair of spectacles which framed a shrewd look that always seemed to be on the lookout for an opportunity, no matter how unethical it might be. When he arrived in Oklahoma, he first found work as a cowboy, but he would soon graduate to more illustrious and more financially lucrative activities. The region which Hale moved to at this time was named after the Osage Indians, a Native American people who lived here in great numbers. Osage is an English rendering of the original name the French gave to the Native American tribe called the Neoconska, meaning people of the Middle Waters, which dominated parts of the Ohio River Valley and the Mississippi River Valley when the French first began establishing trade stations along the course of these riverine routeways in the 17th century. The Osage dominated much of what is now Ohio and the surrounding regions by the 18th century, but their history here went back over two millennia to when the mound-building cultures of the American Midwest and South had first begun to flourish in a vast region from Texas east to the Atlantic Ocean. But like all their brethren further to the east, the Osage came under increasing pressure from the United States from the late 18th century onwards. As this occurred, there were growing drives to transplant the natives of regions like Ohio, Alabama and Tennessee into which the US wished to expand further westwards to land which was deemed to be unoccupied. The most infamous example of this was the Trail of Tears, when 60,000 people from several native groups were forced west of the Mississippi from places like Tennessee and Alabama in the 1830s by the government, leading to the deaths of thousands. The Osage soon fell prey to such a scheme themselves. Indeed, they were involved to some extent in the removals of the 1820s and 1830s, while they were also devastated by a smallpox pandemic which ravaged native populations all across North America in 1837 and 1838. Many of them ended up in places like Kansas, but others tried to remain on their ancestral lands in Ohio and fight the US government as part of the Indian Wars of the mid-19th century, which focused primarily on the Sioux and Lakota Indians further to the northwest, in what are now the Dakotas and Montana. Some Osage were hired by the US government at this time as scouts to help the Americans map out and explore the area, but others continued to resist. By the 1870s, though, it was becoming clear to the Native Americans across the continent that they were fighting a lost cause. Many were corralled into reservations, but some managed to strike deals with the government in Washington for their lands. The Osage were one of the better arbiters in this respect and managed to acquire enough financing that they were in a position to buy their own reservation lands, thus ensuring a degree of self-determination in their own affairs. This was located in the north-central region of what was then known as the Oklahoma Territory. It consisted of a one and a half million acre plot of land and is coterminous with Osage County in the state of Oklahoma today. It was to this region that Hale gravitated some years later. The events which followed would not have occurred had Oklahoma not turned out to be such an oil-rich region. Today, other parts of the United States are synonymous with oil. California, for instance, had its oil boom from the 1870s onwards, which produced much of the wealth which later went into building up Hollywood, while Texas is regarded as the heart of American oil country. But in reality, Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Oklahoma was the thriving heart of the oil industry in the United States. There was more oil by far being produced here, per square mile, than any other region in the country, and the Osage soon discovered that they were sitting on quite a lot of it. In 1894, the first discovery of large oil deposits were made under the lands owned by the Osage. While the Osage were not in a position to begin exploiting the reserves themselves, they were soon in contact with oilmen who had experience in laying down oil wells and extracting the energy in large quantities. Some of this was through the intercession of Henry Foster and Edwin B. Foster, two oilmen operating out of Kansas. They were looking to turn a profit themselves, but as the Osage owned the vast land on which the oil was sitting, it was clear that the natives were soon to become wealthy if they struck a good deal with those who would take it out of the ground. In the mid-1890s, an agreement was worked out between the Fosters, the Osage, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The latter was a government body, and despite the often brutal treatment of various Native American groups by the US government, 
in the century between US independence and the end of the Sioux Wars, by the late 19th century, Washington often did act in ways which aimed to treat groups such as the Osage with a modicum of respect, and in the events which would follow, it was the government which eventually acted in defense of the Osage. In the mid-1890s, the Bureau of Indian Affairs eventually agreed that the Fosters could begin prospecting for oil and extracting it from Osage territory, but they were to pay the Osage 10% of all profits therefrom. In order to understand how the Osage became so wealthy and why individuals like Hale became involved in trying to steal their wealth, one needs to have an overall view of exactly how much oil was being extracted from beneath the earth in Oklahoma in the early 20th century, and how much the Osage were making from this. Between the 1850s and the 1920s, Oklahoma was rivaled only by California in terms of the volume of oil that it produced, and for large stretches of time during this era, it was the largest producer of any region in the United States. Production began to peak in the decades following the discovery of oil on the Osage Territory. It peaked in the 1920s, when Hale's story also took center stage, with production of approximately 700,000 barrels of oil per day in Oklahoma. And the United States had emerged as the world's foremost economic power by then, meaning that the demand for oil was enormous, and the profits correspondingly huge. Often the Osage collected in excess of $10 million a year as part of their 10% royalties, and in the early 1920s, this peaked towards $30 million, a sum equivalent to hundreds of millions in today's money. To get a sense of exactly how wealthy this made individual members of the Osage community, we need to look at exactly how many people this was divided between. There were hundreds of families living on the Osage lands in Oklahoma, meaning that there were several thousand who were entitled to a part of the payment for the oil revenue, which was generated every year. Some of these were children, so the pool was reduced accordingly, but given that the sum which was received annually in the early 1920s was equivalent to half a billion dollars today, the sum of money which the average Osage could expect to receive was substantial indeed by the standards of the time. This was called a head right, the right of each Osage to share in the oil wealth. Add to this the fact that the region also began to develop economically, as oil prospectors moved in and attendant services developed on lands which were also owned by the Osage, and the result was that this community was quickly moving from extreme poverty to wealth in the early 20th century. By the 1910s, the region was developing in such a way that the Osage were living in large houses with servants and automobiles, still a rarity in that part of Oklahoma to convey them into town and around the area. This was a version of early 20th century America where society was turned on its head. It was the Native Americans who were wealthy here, and the average American of European extraction that was cleaning their homes and buying in luxury commodities to the region for them. It has been estimated that collectively the Osage constituted the wealthiest group of people in the world at one time, by the end of the 1910s and the start of the 1920s. There was, though, a complicating factor in all of this, one which is highly relevant for Hale's story. While the federal government had ensured back in the mid-1890s that the Osage were awarded for any oil that was extracted from beneath their lands, they had also done so with the characteristic type of racial attitudes of the time, which believed that the natives were incapable of looking after their own affairs. Accordingly, a system of guardianship was set up in 1897, whereby any Osage who were deemed to be unable to look after their newfound wealth would have guardians appointed to monitor what they did with their money and to decide whether they were spending it appropriately. This system was rife for abuse, and years later there were more lawyers present per capita in the Osage Territory than in any other part of America, as individuals tried to exploit the Osage and control their wealth. What was more, the guardianship system often functioned in such a way that if an individual member of the Osage community died, their oil payments, or head rights, could continue to flow to their former guardian, particularly so if there were children involved when the person died or some other complicating factor of this nature. All of this would end in tragedy for the Osage in the 1920s. Back in the 1900s, Hale began to prosper when he arrived to Osage Territory. He started off as a cowboy on a ranch, driving cattle between Oklahoma and his native Texas, and onwards again to Kansas, 
often with the livestock being sent north towards Chicago and other major towns and cities for supply to the wealthier East Coast markets where the gilded age upper middle class families had a taste for beef. While the cowboys of the era have been immortalized in Western films and novels, it was not glamorous work. It was long, arduous, uncomfortable and badly paid, and Hale soon began to aspire to something else. To do so, he first began saving his meager wages, and after a time had put together enough to be able to start buying his own herd. Over time, he used this to grow his wealth within Osage territory, but even this promising beginning in Oklahoma met with disaster. After a series of business and economic setbacks, Hale ended up bankrupt in the mid-1900s. Yet even this new setback only made him more determined, though unfortunately for his Native American neighbors, he became ever more ruthless too. In the course of the second half of the 1900s, he used every means possible to begin building himself back up as a cattleman, becoming an expert in the business, but also cutting corners through insurance fraud and other illegal methods. It worked, and by the end of the 1900s, Hale had become a prosperous figure in Osage territory. The 1910s saw him emerge as arguably the most powerful man in Osage territory. As he ruthlessly cornered every business opportunity, he amassed an estate of some 45,000 acres of land, buying up the farms from competitors, leasing lands from the Osage, and cultivating relationships with the most powerful politicians in Oklahoma. His appearance changed too. Gone was the rustic cowboy that had arrived in Oklahoma, and in its place, Hale emerged as a genteel business figure who dressed in a suit with a bow tie and a felt hat. He was also named as a reserve deputy sheriff in Fairfax County, and in this capacity had charge over a substantial element of law enforcement in the Osage Territory. Walking around the region with a pistol strapped to his side, by that time, he already had a controlling stake in the Fairfax Bank, and so was a powerful local moneylender. Years later, it was speculated that Hale was a millionaire by the end of the 1910s, and was widely referred to as the King of the Osage. Such was his economic and political power in the region. But it was seemingly never enough for Hale. Moreover, his methods hinted at his future crimes. Much of his wealth was accumulated in the 1900s and 1910s by exploitative dealings with the Osage, engaging in land leases and trade deals with the Native Americans, which were to his advantage and directly exploiting the Osage's lack of familiarity with certain areas of land law and economic policy. Yet even so, Hale would soon decide he could go further still to benefit himself at their expense. While Hale was enriching himself in Oklahoma through dubious business activities in the 1910s, trouble was brewing for the Osage. The Guardian system and the associated head rights had presented an opportunity for ruthless individuals in the Osage territory. And as the amount of money being generated by the oil wells of the territory increased year by year, many saw an opportunity. This was especially the case as countries like the United States moved away from a reliance on coal as the primary fossil fuel driving their economies to a greater reliance on oil and petroleum. Moreover, the full extent of the oil reserves on the Osage Territory was only established in 1917, when the new wells were drilled. With this, it became clear that great wealth would continue to flow to the Osage for many, many years to come. If an individual could establish themselves as a guardian to an Osage individual or family, then if something happened to the Osage in question, the guardian might hope to benefit financially. Similarly, if a member of the Osage tribe died, their lands might become available, and if a white man could muscle in, he could hope to benefit financially from the oil wealth of the region. This was especially the case as the head rights functioned in the 1910s and early 1920s, in such a manner that a non-Osage could inherit them from an Osage that died. This loophole would be closed in time, but it presented an opportunity for Hale and others before the federal government moved to prevent exploitation of the law. What has come to be termed the Osage Reign of Terror only began to gain attention and notoriety from 1922 onwards, but it is now accepted that the first murders might have been committed as early as 1918. It was at this time that an Osage woman by the name of Minnie Brown died at just 27 years of age from what at the time was described as a peculiar disease, 
the specifics of which could not be determined by her doctors. It is now generally understood that Minnie had been poisoned and that her death constituted the first killing in the Reign of Terror. Over the next decade, dozens more Osage would fall victim to surreptitious activities and murders by their neighbours, most of them being white settlers in Osage territory who were trying to claim the head rights of their victims. Over the 10-year period, at least 60 Osage were killed and the murders terrorised the wider Osage community. As we will see, it would take a federal investigation of events in Osage County and a legal altering of the manner in which the head rights were transferred to guardians in 1925 before the killings would come to an end. In the events which followed, Hale would become closely aligned with his nephews, Ernest and Brian Burkhart, sons of his sister Martha. Though the relationship was hardly equal, and Ernest, the more significant of the two brothers in the events which ensued, would later state of his uncle that he was not the kind of man to ask you to do something, he told you. Nevertheless, Ernest developed a close relationship with Hale and viewed him as a surrogate father. He first arrived in Osage County in 1912 as a green behind the ears 19 year old who had left Texas to settle in what was viewed as one of the last vestiges of the American West in Oklahoma. There, he began working for his uncle in various capacities as part of his ever-growing business and legal empire in the Osage Territory. Some of this was simple driving and delivery work, and it was in this capacity that Ernest would meet Molly, the sister of Millie, whose unusual demise in 1918 is viewed as the possible beginnings of the Reign of Terror, and whose family had acquired great wealth owing to the head rights and oil revenue that poured in during the 1910s and into the 1920s. Their relationship would form the basis for much of the events which followed. When Molly met Ernest in the mid-1910s, it was still common for the Osage to enter into arranged marriages with a fellow Osage. However, as the tribe became richer and the social structures of the Osage territory had changed, so too had this custom. Several of Molly's siblings and relatives had consequently married whites, and she was not averse to doing the same. She soon fell for Ernest, he was a somewhat coarse individual, prone to heavy drinking and gambling, though these were not exactly uncommon habits in the place and time in question, but there also seemed to be a more affectionate side to him. For instance, while she spoke some English, he nevertheless began studying the Osage dialect after they met, so that he could converse with her in her native language. He also brushed aside the mockery, which was directed at him by his friends, for forming a relationship with a Native American woman, while when she was sick, which was regularly owing to suffering from diabetes at a time when the condition was not as treatable as it is today, he cared for her. All of this seemed to win her over. In 1917, they married, and in the years that followed, they started a family, with a daughter Elizabeth arriving first, followed by a son named James. Their relationship is an enigma, and to this day it remains unclear whether Ernest genuinely cared for Molly at first or whether the entire union was an elaborate deception which he concocted under the guidance of his uncle over a period of many years. It was with Molly's sister Anna that the Osage murders began to intensify in the 1920s. Anna had developed a somewhat problematic personality by this time, specifically concerning her tendency to drink excessively. On the 21st of May 1921, she attended a luncheon which Molly had organised for her extended family and friends but when Anna showed up, she was already drunk. In the hours that followed, she drank from a flask, flirted with Ernest's brother, Brian, and subsequently started fights with almost everyone in attendance. Eventually, she managed to sober up after several hours and Molly sent her home with Brian. It was the last time the sisters saw each other. Six days later, some squirrel hunters found her body in a desperate state of decomposition in some boggy water near the road between Fairfax and Poor Husker. Molly was called upon to try to identify the bloated corpse, but could only do so through the gold fillings in her teeth. Though it would not be determined until much, much later, one of those who had been included in the search team, Kelsey Morrison, a well-known local bootlegger and dope smuggler, had killed her on the night of the 21st or early hours of the 22nd, after she left Molly's. He had done so on the orders of none other than William Hale, probably with the complicity of Brian Burkhart who had taken her home from Molly's party that evening. An autopsy revealed a gunshot wound to the back of her head. It would subsequently be revealed in years to come 
that Morrison had owed $600 to Hale, a very substantial sum of money in the early 1920s, and he had carried out the murder in order to have the debt cancelled. Yet the motives were not initially clear, as Anna's head rights on the oil money were transferred to her immediate Osage family members. Yet with each member of Molly's family that would subsequently die, the possibility of Anna and her family members' head rights all transferring to Ernest Burkhart, Hale's nephew and protege, became ever greater. The murders mounted from there. On the same day that Anna's body was discovered, that of another Osage by the name of Charles Whitehorn was stumbled upon by an oil man not far away with two bullet wounds between his eyes. He had been murdered execution style. Whitehorn had disappeared a week before Anna and had been missing for two weeks when he was discovered. What alerted local police to a possible connection between the two murders was that the same bullet types were found to have been used in both instances. Perhaps the same person had killed both Anna and Charles, but at the time no one was identified as the possible suspect by the authorities. Molly argued strongly with the local police for them to investigate her sister's disappearance and murder more concretely, but such was the attitude at the time to the Native Americans that they effectively refused to do so. A similar lethargy characterized the response months later in 1922 to the death of Anna Sanford, a woman who had recently married a white man by the name of Tom McCoy. Anna was not found murdered in cold blood like Anna Brown or Charles Whitehorn, but her death was suspicious and is believed to have been an instance of poisoning. What is especially revealing about Hale's involvement in this particular homicide is that Tom McCoy, Anna's widower, quickly married Hale's niece after he inherited his deceased Osage wife's head rights. The next major victim to which Hale can be connected was George Bigheart. George was a relative of one of the most prominent of all the Osage families. James Bigheart, for instance, had been a chief of the Osage in the 1890s and 1900s, a man who spoke seven languages, including French and Latin, and who wore a suit and tie, realizing that the best way to beat the government and white man in their land grabs, as the American frontier was closing in, was to match them at their own game. George was James's nephew. In 1923, at 46 years of age, he was mysteriously taken ill in Osage territory and was sent to Oklahoma City to a hospital there. It now seems relatively clear that Big Heart was given some poisoned whiskey to drink and this killed him in the hospital shortly after he arrived there. But this was not before he disclosed some secret information regarding his own circumstances and the deaths which were occurring amongst the Osage to a white attorney by the name of W. W. Vaughan while George was on his deathbed. Incredibly, Vaughan then phoned the Osage County Sheriff and said he needed to meet with him urgently concerning the murders. But the last time he was seen was when he boarded an overnight train to go and meet the Sheriff. When the train arrived to Osage Territory, Vaughan wasn't on it, and he was never seen again. Big Heart died shortly afterwards in hospital, and whatever information he had revealed about William Hale and Ernest Burkhardt, who had been present at the hospital in Oklahoma City when Vaughan visited George there, was never disclosed to the police. If any casual observer had been able to identify a connection between the people who were being killed and William Hale, the most prominent businessman in Osage territory, then they would have had their suspicions corroborated by the next death. In February 1923, a 40-year-old Osage by the name of Henry Roan showed up dead, having been found shot to death in his car. Roan's name itself was symptomatic of the manner in which the Osage had suffered systematic persecution over the decades. His tribal name was Roan Horse, but at school in Oklahoma, he had been forced to cut off the braids he wore his hair in and to change his name to the more anglicized Henry Roan. Although he had two children who would inherit his head rights and the income from the oil money that was due to his family, Hale had an insurance claim on Roan's life. Roan had listed Hale, who he referred to as his best friend, as the recipient of a $25,000 insurance policy, a very hefty sum of money by the standards of the early to mid-1920s. Hale had also been seen in town with Roan shortly before the Osage man disappeared, only reappearing when he was found dead in his automobile. Thus, although Hale acted as a pallbearer at Roan's funeral after he was discovered, he had benefited greatly from Henry's death. Roan's case would eventually come back to haunt Hale, though. The next major killing targeted Rita Smith, Molly Brown's sister. She had accompanied Molly back in the summer of 1921, 
when they had gone to identify their sister Anna's body after it had been found in the countryside. She was married to William Bill Smith, the man whose idea it had been to try to identify Anna's body that day by checking to see if she had Anna's idiosyncratic gold teeth fillings. With Anna's death and the narrowing of their family, both Molly and Rita had become wealthier as they inherited the head rights to the oil money of other family members. As such, for anyone who was looking to ultimately acquire a full stake in the oil money which was due to the Brown family, it would be necessary to also murder or otherwise kill Molly and Rita. Rita and her husband Bill became the next targets of Hale and his accomplices in their murder spree. An added incentive for Hale was that Bill Smith had been conducting his own unofficial investigation into both the murder of Anna in 1921 and the mysterious circumstances in which their other sister, Millie, had died back in 1918. Bill had been married to Millie originally, before remarrying her sister, Rita, after Millie's untimely and suspicious demise. Though Bill was a former horse thief and a heavy drinker who had been known to strike Rita when drunk, there is no evidence that he was involved with Hale and the Burkharts in their campaign against the Browns and other Osage in the Territory. On the contrary, he had met with several individuals in the early weeks of 1923 that seemed to have information about what might have happened to Anna a year and a half earlier. It is probably no coincidence that Hale moved against Rita and Bill shortly after Bill had been in touch with these sources of information. Just a few days later, the Smiths were at home one night when they heard what seemed to be someone rustling around the perimeter of their home. They went looking for the source of the noise but found nothing. Then, a few nights later, the same noise was heard again. It was enough to convince Bill and Rita to pack up their things and move to a rented house nearby. But there, the peculiar events seemed to follow them. For one thing, the dogs which their new neighbours owned all started showing up dead, as though they had been poisoned. A few weeks later, a bomb was planted underneath the Smith's rented home, detonating at three o'clock in the morning. The explosion killed Rita and Bill, sending out a blast which was felt all over the neighbourhood and blowing out the windows of the houses in the area. Nearby, Molly Brown felt the explosion herself, which killed the third sister of hers to die in the space of five years. Millie in 1918, Anna in 1921, and now Rita in 1923. The noose was tightening around Molly, even as she inherited a still greater claim to the oil head rights with the demise of another sister. By the mid-1920s, the mounting numbers of murders, bombings, poisonings and deaths under suspicious circumstances in Osage territory was beginning to attract attention from quarters further afield, which Hale and his accomplices would have preferred to have stayed away from Oklahoma, specifically the nascent Federal Bureau of Investigation. Policing in the United States, as anywhere in the Western world, had been done on an ad hoc basis for centuries, and even well into the 19th century. It was only in 1839 that the Metropolitan Police Act had established a professional police force in Britain, and in the US, policing activities and crime prevention was primarily carried out for decades after that by local sheriffs and lawmen or by the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Only in 1896 was the National Bureau of Criminal Identification, the forerunner of the modern Federal Bureau of Investigation, or FBI, set up. Its remit was expanded in the years that followed as anarchist and labor movements created the perception of social unrest across America, with the Bureau of Investigation then established in 1908 by President Theodore Roosevelt. It would finally manifest into the modern FBI in the early 1930s, as J. Edgar Hoover tried to crack down on criminality at the end of Prohibition. But by then the institution had developed extensively, in considerable part owing to investigations such as that which was led by Bureau agent Tom White in Osage Territory in the mid-1920s. Tom White was born in Texas a few years after Hale. He was the son of a local lawman, Robert Emmett White, and moved into the same field when he came of age, joining the Texas Rangers in the 1900s before becoming a special agent for the Santa Fe Railway Company and the Southern Pacific Railroad in the 1910s. Thereafter, he became a Bureau of Investigation officer. He consequently had decades of experience when he was assigned to investigate the murders which were occurring in Osage Territory in the mid-1920s. He received a call from Hoover in the summer of 1925 and was summoned to Washington, D.C., where the head of the FBI informed him that he was to proceed to Osage Territory 
and find out who was murdering all of these conspicuously wealthy Native Americans. In taking over the Oklahoma field office, White was assuming a position which was generating more crime per capita than any other field office run by the FBI. As such, when he arrived to take up the position there in late July, he had extensive work to do. But White was determined, and within weeks he had reviewed dozens of case files and was coming to some initial conclusions. There was no pattern to these murders, such as one might expect from a serial killer or a single individual. Clearly, there was more than one person involved, and given the wealth and status of many of the victims, there was a clear motive. Whoever was killing the Osage was doing so for their money. White's investigations would soon lead him to the Burkharts and then to William Hale. Meanwhile, in Washington, Congress decided in 1925 to pass a law banning anyone who was not at least half Osage from inheriting the head rights of an Osage when they died. Thus, in the nation's capital, it was clear to many what was really at the root of what was happening far away in Oklahoma. White's investigations into the events occurring in Osage territory began just as Hale's great plan to capture the wealth of the Brown family was about to come to fruition. With her three sisters dead, Molly Brown was now the recipient of a great amount of oil money coming from Osage head rights. Should she die, her payments would begin accruing to her children, who were William Hale's great nieces and nephews through his being the uncle of her husband, Ernest Burkhart. It appears, though, that Hale and Burkhart were anxious to avoid Molly's demise coming about through as clearly suspicious circumstances as had occurred with Anna in 1921 or Rita in 1923. If Molly was gunned down like Anna, or her house exploded like Rita's had, then surely the local authorities, as much as they might have been inclined to avoid casting a net of suspicion over Hale or his relatives, would have to investigate the matter further. Thus, Hale and Ernest began plotting a way to get rid of Molly in a more subtle way after Rita had died. Her diabetes seemed a perfect smokescreen to suggest that her health was deteriorating naturally. Hence, in the mid-1920s, Hale saw to it that they began slowly poisoning Molly. This was a slower method of murder, and also an infinitely riskier one. She might well realize what was happening, and there was certainly sufficient grounds for her to be hypervigilant, given what had happened to her family members, and so many other members of the Osage in recent times. And so, when Molly's health began deteriorating sharply in the course of 1925, she became suspicious, and eventually she came to the conclusion that as much as her marriage to Ernest had initially seemed to be one of affection, that he was most likely poisoning her. This was certainly the conclusion she had come to by late 1925, when she sent a message to a local priest in which she outlined her belief that her health was deteriorating, owing to being poisoned rather than from her diabetes. She would ultimately be the lucky member of the Brown family. Shortly afterwards, she left Ernest with their children and would live to tell the tale of her brush with William Hale and the Burkharts. Conversely, the net was tightening by this time on Hale and his accomplices. When Tom White had acquainted himself sufficiently with the evidence concerning the murders of the Osage in the 1920s, he began to focus on one case in particular, the murder of Henry Roan back in the spring of 1923. Roan's case was especially suspicious, given that Hale had only recently taken out a $25,000 insurance claim on his life. This clearly created a certain amount of circumstantial evidence, but there was no direct evidence, such as eyewitnesses or a murder weapon, that could clearly link Hale to the murder. However, it raised enough suspicions for White to place Hale at the centre of a vast conspiracy to collect Osage head rights, with the murder of Molly's family members over a period of years from 1918 onwards being the central plank of Hale's conspiracy. This conclusion led him to begin looking at Ernest Burkhart, Hale's nephew, who had married Molly many years earlier, and the man who, if anything happened to her, would now acquire a huge controlling interest over the many head rights which had fallen to Molly. It was this which led White to begin investigating both Hale and the Burkharts, and Ernest would prove to be the weak link. By the dawn of 1926, White had acquired enough evidence to issue a warrant for the arrest of Hale and Ernest for the murders of Rita and Bill Smith. Hale absconded and could not be located when the arresting officers went for him on the 4th of January, but Ernest was picked up and taken in for questioning. In the meantime, Hale presented himself to federal agents and calmly protested his innocence. But Ernest was another matter. Under questioning in January 1926, 
he eventually began to reveal details of the intricate conspiracy which his uncle had overseen for the better part of a decade, and which had come so close to being concluded if only Molly had not grown suspicious and had continued ingesting the poison that was being surreptitiously given to her. When White and other prosecutors revealed that they had testimony from a certain Blackie Thompson that Ernest had tried to hire him to carry out several of the murders years earlier, the floodgates opened. Ernest revealed that he had married Molly many years earlier on Hale's directive, that he should be in a position to collect the many head rights which would be accruing into her hands as her family members kept dying. Thus did he implicate his uncle. In the weeks that followed, Ernest was placed on trial and was sentenced to a reduced term in prison in return for his cooperation in prosecuting Hale. Hale's trial soon followed. It became a circus as Ernest refused to deliver on his promise to testify against his uncle and instead agreed to testify in his defense. Meanwhile, Burkhardt also tried to sue the government for extracting a confession from him under duress. Other witnesses and individuals allegedly implicated in the various murders either pulled out of testifying or refused to cooperate, as Hale began trying to pull strings to intimidate anyone that was possibly going to proceed against him. At one point, even Ernest came to the conclusion that his uncle was trying to have him killed before he could testify against him. Eventually, Ernest flipped again and did testify against Hale in his first trial, which was held in Guthrie from late July 1926 onwards. But such was the convoluted nature of the evidence and overlapping conspiracies, as well as Hale's influence in the wider region, that the jury, when it finished deliberating on the 25th of August, returned a hung verdict and a mistrial was declared. The government and the Bureau were not going to let matters slide. By the autumn of 1926, too much was riding on the result of the investigation back in Washington, and Hoover ordered that Hale and his accomplices were to be prosecuted in any way possible. As a consequence, a grand jury indicted Jim Springer, Hale's attorney, on the grounds that Hale had sought to intimidate several witnesses in his client's initial trial. With this, a second trial commenced in October 1926, one which was short-lived and resulted in a guilty verdict just nine days later. Hale was sentenced to life in prison at Leavenworth Prison in Kansas, ironically a penitentiary where Tom White, the federal investigator who led the Osage investigations, would soon be appointed as warden. Yet even then, Hale managed to exploit several legal loopholes to try to wriggle free, successfully disputing the results of his second trial on the basis that he was tried in the wrong district court within Oklahoma. In the end, it would take a third trial, this time prosecuted in a federal court before Hale was finally definitively sentenced to life in prison in January 1929. Justice had been slow in coming, but at last, 11 years after the first murder had been committed, with the poisoning of Millie Brown, Hale entered Leavenworth with a lifetime sentence. He would be out in under 20 years. Ultimately, the conviction of Hale and the Burkarts and their accomplices was just the tip of the iceberg. While Hale had doubtlessly been the most prominent individual when it came to carrying out the murders of the Osage, there were many others who were acting independently of him. In fact, while the official murder rate of the Reign of Terror stands at about 60 people, David Gran, in his award-winning book on the topic, Killers of the Flower Moon, cites Louis F. Burns, a leading historian on the Osage murders, who claimed there were probably hundreds of killings, many of them recorded as accidents or people who died under mysterious circumstances after unusual illnesses. For instance, Kelsey Morrison, a man who was probably involved in the murder of Anna Brown, was possibly also involved in several other poisonings in the 1920s, which were never investigated as murders. He subsequently married Tilly Stepson, an Osage woman whose husband had been poisoned in 1922. She in turn became suspicious of Kelsey when she overheard him talking about the use of strychnine as a poison, but before she could divorce him and remove her two Osage children from his guardianship, she too died under suspicious circumstances. Morrison had almost certainly poisoned her, and there were many others like this. Often groups of individuals were aiding each other to murder families of Osage throughout the area. For instance, the local doctors certainly killed several Osage and benefited from their head rights, but they also supplied poison to others. The murders which occurred during the Reign of Terror were an open secret throughout Osage County, as the white population literally conspired to kill as many of the natives here as possible, even as the FBI tried to intervene 
in a sort of localized genocide being perpetrated over oil money. Despite being sentenced to life in prison in 1929, William Hale would serve less than 20 years for the multiple murders he orchestrated. On the 31st of July 1947, he was paroled at the explicit command of President Harry S. Truman. Truman came from Missouri, not far from Osage County, and had spent much of his early life in the 1900s, 1910s, and 1920s living in this part of the Midwest in Kansas City and other locations. As such, he had grown up in the region and was immersed in the settler community that Hale and others had lived in when they committed their crimes. Consequently, as inexcusable as his actions seem in retrospect, he seems to have viewed Hale and others with some sympathy and arranged for Hale to be pardoned after serving 18 years in prison. Eventually, many others who were involved in the Reign of Terror murders would be paroled early. Ernest Burkhart was released initially in 1937, but he repeatedly broke the law in the years that followed and was in and out of jail for much of the 1940s and 1950s. His final release came in 1965, when the Oklahoma governor, Henry Bellman, fully pardoned Burkhart for his crimes. Back in 1947, when he was released from prison, Hale headed northwest to Montana, one of the most underpopulated and rustic parts of the United States by the middle of the 20th century, and an environment which was similar to that which he had known in Oklahoma decades earlier. There, Hale fell back into familiar patterns, despite being a man nearing his mid-70s by that time. He acquired a position working as a ranch overseer in the state on a farm owned by Benny Binion, a career criminal who had first made his fortune in Texas back in the 1920s, operating illegal gambling dens and casinos in the Dallas and Fort Worth area. He and Hale were likely acquainted with each other from that time, while also having periods of lengthy incarceration in common, Binion having been implicated in multiple homicides in the 1930s. In the 1950s, he made lots of money in the early development of Las Vegas, while Hale managed to stake out a prosperous enough retirement working with him. In his later years, Hale was often known to state that he and his associates would have got away with everything back in the 1920s if Burkhardt hadn't talked to the FBI after he was arrested in 1926. He spent his last years in Phoenix, Arizona, dying in a nursing home in the city on the 15th of August 1962, at 87 years of age. He was buried in Wichita in Kansas. The Osage killings largely came to an end in the late 1920s, as Hale and his accomplices and others who had acted independently of his actions were arrested and charged with various murders and attacks on the Osage over the past decade. However, what exactly had happened remained a mystery for decades to come, and a full understanding of what had occurred still eludes us in all particulars. John Joseph Matthews, a member of the Osage tribe who was born in Oklahoma in 1894 and who had lived through the Reign of Terror, first sought to begin investigating the events of the late 1910s and 1920s in a book called Sundown, which he published in 1934. Thereafter, charting the story of the Osage and the crimes committed against them became his life work, culminating in 1961 in the Osages, Children of the Middle Water, a comprehensive collection of oral histories and statements taken from members of the tribe. Owing to his work and dedicated investigative efforts by other members of the tribe, the Osage developed a clear idea of what had gone wrong in their treatment by the government and how the Guardian system had led to the reign of terror. As a consequence, in the late 1990s, the Osage sued the federal government for mismanagement of their affairs and misplacement of the funds which were owed to them over a period of several decades. Some of these claims were backdated to the late 19th century. In 2011, the US government admitted culpability and settled the outstanding claims for approximately $380 million, a sum equivalent to roughly $25,000 per head of the nearly 16,000 members of the Osage tribe still alive in the early 21st century. The story of the Osage, the reign of terror, and the role of William Hale in it has been most notably explored by the investigative journalist David Gran in his 2017 book, Killers of the Flower Moon. Gran drew on other studies by figures like Matthews and Lawrence Hogan, but also conducted new research which led him to speculating about who was responsible for some of the unsolved murders. 
showing in the process the way that the orchestrated campaign of terror and murder against the Osage was an open secret within the wider community in the region in the 1920s, one which dozens of people were actively involved in. The book went on to win the National Book Award in 2017 and was a number one bestseller on the New York Times bestseller list for a time that year. It has now been adapted for the screen by Martin Scorsese, and the film, starring Robert De Niro as William Hale and Leonardo DiCaprio as Ernest Burkhardt, is due for widespread release in October 2023, with many Oscar nominations predicted. Although the events surrounding the Osage Reign of Terror remain clouded in mystery today, what is clear from what has been revealed by studies by Gran and others is that Hale was central to the attacks on the Osage in the 1920s. Few individuals seem to have been implicated directly in as many of the murders as he was, and it appears that he benefited substantially from them initially, until such time as the nascent Federal Bureau of Investigation became involved in figuring out what was happening to the Osage. But what was perhaps even worse about Hale was the manner in which he corrupted others around him. In the course of the early to mid-1920s, he not only orchestrated the murder of many Osage, but he dragged others into his violent conduct, who otherwise might not have become involved in the violence being aimed at the Osage, notably the Burkharts. He was unquestionably the central figure in the reign of terror. And yet his story is one about how extreme violence and murder could meet with little punishment in the development of the United States. Despite Hale being found guilty of some of the murders and imprisoned, ultimately he was released early on the back of his connections and lived out the rest of his life as a free man. Had it been an Osage cattleman orchestrating the murders of oilmen of European descent in Oklahoma in the 1920s, they would hardly have escaped so lightly. What do you think of William Hale? Do you think he might have been responsible for even more of the murders of the Osage than we know about? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.